Hey, welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess Videos. I'm just getting back from a uh, wilderness trip in the Kilgore Wilderness where I did a uh, rough country survival video where I built a shelter out there and then it snowed on me. And uh, it worked real good. It didn't snow heavy, but it was a lot of fun. For those of you who watched that survival video, you saw me cooking an entire package of bacon in my number six iron skillet. <laughs> and I was mentioning that before I went on the trip a couple days ago, I weighed myself and I've lost two pounds and then I was going to regain it by eating all that bacon. And I know you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you, but I've lost another pound. So making that shelter worked off all that meat. <laughs> I didn't eat carbohydrates with the bacon, though. You can eat all the bacon you want if you don't eat the carbs with it. I uh, heard, heard that on a health tidbit once. but Anyway, so I've lost three pounds this last, what, nine or ten days. So I'm coming down. I mean, I'm coming down off of 259, 260. What's that like? The last nine months I've lost almost 20 pounds. Not a record, but I'm on the way down. So this is the good news. Now the really good news is, if you haven't watched that survival video, go watch it. It's a lot of fun. It's gorgeous country. I'm serious. It's wonderful. But I have a great chess game by Vladimir Kramnik, the former world chess champion. He versed, he's versing the Dutch Grandmaster, El Van Welly. The illustration of this game is quite remarkable in that they change up the different strategies. They have one advantage and they use it for a few minutes and then they exchange that for another advantage. And it's a remarkable lesson on that. So let's see how this works. Kramnik opens with the queen pawn opening. And Welly is up to the challenge. And Kramnik pushes the c4, which says, I'm coming at you. And Welly is opening well with the Grunfeld defense here. And Kramnik will push the c3. And then Welly answers, of course, the, the fight is going to be for the center. But, of course, it always is for the center. And Kramnik immediately says, okay, I will take that pawn. And Welly takes the pawn. Kramnik's next move is intended to establish his strong center. So he pushes the e pawn to e4. Rather than taking Welly's knight and having the situation such that the queen comes into the game up to here. Kramnik has a better method of establishing a more dominant center, which actually plays a ginormic role in this game. By presenting the question to the knight in the center, he allows Welly to exchange knights instead of him exchanging knights. And what this does for Kramnik now is it gives him the opportunity to establish by occupation with pawns a very good center. Welly has lost his D pawn, one of his central pawns. So the center establishment is going to, this opens the strategy for Kramnik and it automatically gives Welly his strategy. He will attack that center. You can't let that kind of a center go unchallenged or it'll just mow you over. One of the uh, one of the main threats Welly could face if he doesn't play this with uh, strict oomph is he could get severely cramped and that is not what Welly wants. He does not want to be cramped with such a fabulous option of Kramnik to push those pawns. Well, he lacks his central pawn, so he's going to attack the center 
in probably the best way that he can. Indirectly, he's going to influence it from a distance, for one thing, for starters. And Kramnik's going to say, yes, it's good. I will bring up my knight to defend my d-pawn, which you are hitting with the bishop. And now Welly makes a very important strategic move. He pushes the c-pawn. So this is superior to this. And it does develop a piece. It does hit his center pawns, but that's the inferior move. And here's why. It's a real interesting description of Black's option of pushing the c5 to hit the center. What this helps prevent is him getting cramped. Him getting blockaded in without room to maneuver his pieces. This opens up that option of bringing the queen out along this diagonal, or straight. It also gives the option of then bringing the knight out, which is much more useful because now you have a pawn, a knight, a queen, and a bishop hitting the d4. Yeah? Whereas... Had he simply done this, he couldn't have had that extra pawn pressure on the d4. He would have been blocking in his own pawn, the c-pawn, and it wouldn't have given the queen the mobility she needed. So you can see why Welly played that c5. It's a really important point that the annotator made on that move. He gave it an exclamation point. That was the correct way to respond to the central buildup of Kramnik. That was a very important issue that the annotator made on this c5 push pawn to give more scope to both the knight and the queen of black because that center of Kramnik is so prominent that he want Black wants to remain mobile. There's no question about it because Kramnik, if he chooses, he can really cramp Black. That's not what Black wants. So just a, a cool idea about the uh, about the c5 push. The bishop will come up defending the d4. This, this developing move makes beautiful sense as opposed to his king bishop simply because he has the pawn defended three times. It's attacked three times, so it's okay. But that's why that bishop developing move makes sense. It's a centralized bishop as well, but you don't want to just lose a central pawn. That is not good. So, and now, see, the, the scope of the queen... And, you know, we hear it said, don't develop your queen too early in the game. There really isn't a white piece here, though, that's going to harass the queen. And he does want to get his pieces mobile because he's going to be fighting the incredible pawn center of Kramnik. And this is one uh, decent way to do it. And so that's why he's attacking the C3, the base of the pawn chain, which is protecting the d4, which is also being attacked. So that developing move, this early, makes sense in light of Kramnik's center. So he's actually putting the pressure on d4 by this move. See how that works? It's very interesting how that, uh, how that works. And so Kramnik will bump his queen up. And now again, the knight c6, c once again, indirectly bringing the queen out, indirectly attacking the d4 by hitting the c3. And now, having pushed that c pawn, hitting the pawn, now the knight also gangs up on that pawn with the bishop, indirectly with the queen. You see how that works? It's real interesting how he does this. 
and the rook will come to c1. A great way. Notice he didn't castle. This is more more better. <laughs> this is this is the right way to do it because he supports the c3. So if later in the game the queen needs to do something else, she's not stuck babysitting that c3. And I say that not in a negative manner. The rook babysitting the c3, quote, babysitting, gives, helps support the solidity of the entire center, especially of the white d4 pawn. So it is not a passive move to put the rook on the c-file right now. See how that works? It's a solid move. And it makes sense to put the rook there as opposed to anywhere else. It also develops a piece. Yeah? So everything about that works. Well, the d4 is attacked. And I mean, really, the whole, the whole basis of the opening would indicate that, yes, the d4 is going to be attacked. Right? That was the whole idea. So he takes and he takes, or, or I should say he retakes again... Kramnik's center with the pawns is very strong, and it does have the support of the pieces. He's playing excellent. Welly is playing excellent. It's no wonder that Kramnik was a world champion, right? I mean, for Pete's sake. This is a very powerful uh, looking center. At the same time, Kramnik is comfortable with exchanging the queens. Now, the question becomes which way to retake the black queen? This is a really important decision for Kramnik because the knight is guarding that very important d4 pawn. The d4 pawn is still being hit twice well, technically three times now. The king's in check. The king's in check, so the queen's got to go, obviously. But if you take away a defender of the pawn by taking it with the knight, the pawn is going to fall. If he takes the queen with the bishop, is also a defender of the d4 pawn, so the d4 pawn will fall. So Kramnik's next move makes perfect sense. Take with the king. And for some people, that's horrifying. Oh my gosh, he can't castle now. He, he recognizes that. In this instance, it's better. It's more viable. It's really critically important to maintain the center and so the king, as a fighting unit, comes out rather early in the game rather than later from a castled position. Kramnik's center is solid. I mean, it's not like his king is going to be chased all around, right? You could, there's really not a lot. There's not a lot of ways that his king can be chased around. By retaking with the king, he completely maintains his center, so that move also makes really good sense. Very interesting move. And now, Welly will castle. And Kramnik pushes the d5. Now, here... Well, he doesn't want to be completely steamrolled because Kramnik actually has that option right now. Yeah. So he's going to put the pin on the pawn so that he doesn't... I mean, there's no real... There's no real uh, useful place for the knight that's safe at this point. And to move it back is to completely surrender the center, which will be a disaster. So 
this rook move makes real good sense, is what I'm trying to say. You see how the grandmasters are thinking through this and analyzing. One thing we really get well in this particular game is the real importance to both players of Kramnik's center. Well, he wants to attack it and get rid of it. Kramnik wants to maintain it. And you can see that is the entire basis of this game at this point. So that's, that's kind of fun to know. Fun to recognize. The king will go back to safety. And you say, see, two wasted moves. No, not wasted at all. Neither of those moves have been wasted. But he's stuck in the center. This is true, he is. However, he owns the center, so it's okay. You see how the context in each individual game uh, more or less determines the rules that we will apply and the rules that it is safe to ignore. You know, castle early. How many times have we said that? In this instance, that wasn't nearly as important as maintaining that strong center. The center is White's King Fortress, not the wing side. See how that works? So, so there are, again, there are exceptions to every cotton picking rule in chess. That's just how it works, man. <laughs> We're never, ever going to get away with that. So he goes King... And now he's going to come to knight a5. And now bishop g5 is interesting. Kramnik is saying that I am going to stop you from pressing e6, hitting the center again. The advanced d pawn gives Kramnik good space, and he he does have more space, but it's real interesting that black is not necessarily cramped, is he? Isn't that fun to see? Because earlier on, black really did proceed to press the C pawn. True, it took away uh, some central pawns early in the game for black, but it has maintained the mobility of his pieces, even though right now Kramnik owns the center, this move helps him indirectly maintain his center. Isn't that kind of cool to see? That's real fun. So, so White Welly is going to, here he comes. He, he's, he's not playing bad chess at all. Neither one of them are. Kramnik will develop, yes. Now, Here's the next phase of the game that is so interesting because we will see a, oh, I mean, they're, they're fighting for uh, strategic dominance and those strategies will change. They evolve through the course of the game. They will let go of one strategy in order to bring about a different one. So now, Welly is going to fight for the C file. It's the only open file, right? And I've said it before, there are many instances where you do want to fight for the open file. In this instance, he lacks a center, a strong center presence. So Welly's decision to fight for the open file makes real good sense. So that rook, and again, he's moved the rook twice, so what? It doesn't matter. He's got a good strategic concept here. Watch. King is going to come up D2. That's the way he protects the file indirectly. Very cool how Kramnik does that, isn't it? By bumping the king up, he defends his C rook with his H rook. Yeah? Notice again, I'm, I'm not trying to keep repeating this, but the center is Kramnik's fortress. His king is, honest to goodness, uh, not exposed. He's not weak. Uh, 
He's not going to be attacked, really, not for the next couple of moves, and it's nothing that he can't prevent. So it's not a crisis that he hasn't castled here. He still gets to shift the strategy with Welly to respond to Welly, even though he's not castled. His rooks both are still extremely useful. And that's what I wanted to point out, that that is really a neat concept to see. Kind of interesting how he really does do this. So, here is the thing, and I'm, I'm going to show you this, I'm going to show you this. You, we might have asked, we might have asked a question here, instead of moving your king, um, in order to support your rook with your other rook like White did. Why not take the rook? Because when rook takes rook, come on, get in there. When rook takes rook, then bishop takes e7. Now, rook can come to here, check, and Kramnik would lose his rook. So this illustrate we have to at least look far enough ahead a couple of moves to realize that when the open file is contested, it's not necessary as such to immediately try to get it. Sometimes you have to leave the tension in the open file. Otherwise, you could end up losing a piece, right? That is why his king to e2 is the better move, because it maintains both of his rooks. Real interesting to see that. And now e6 anyway. So the bishop has done his job on g5, but uh, now he, he's gone ahead and pushed e6, and this makes sense too, because you cannot let Kramnik keep that fabulous center. It will become a pawn roller eventually. So black strategy has been laid out pretty much from the beginning. He must attack the center in every means possible. And that's what we see him doing here. Now his bishop, having done his job, now he comes back here to a more useful area where he's going to put pressure on black's queen side. Yeah. You'll notice neither player is technically attacking the king, the opposing king. It's not about a kingside attack here. It's all about the center. That's another uh, really important lesson. For those of us who love to attack the king, yeah, but the king is over there. Get your pieces over there. All true, but the power is here. And I mean, hey, when you have the power in the center, <laughs> you can't go wrong maintaining that center and vice versa. If your opponent has the power in the center, it's not about a kingside attack. It's the center to attack. It's a good little lesson to see, and we see this throughout the game. So again, the e6 makes sense, and that makes this move make good sense, bishop e3. And of course, look, he moved the e-pawn up to attack. Take it. Attack the center. Yeah. Yeah, we understand that. That makes beautiful sense. So now, because of the way Black has carried out his strategy of he more or less has given up a couple of central pawns, he hasn't directly occupied the center, but he has maintained some influence in it somewhat, uh, and now that you've got the direct attack and you carry out the direct attack, remaining mobile has helped black in this instance. Yeah? So, that's what Welly was hoping. He was saying, okay, yeah, I know I'm not going to be able to possess the center physically by putting pawns in it, but I want to keep my presence, I want to keep my ability to keep the pressure on in the center. And that's how he's been playing. So that makes sense. And now b6, and now Bishop to a6, absolutely. Now, the, <laughs> we, 
we again get to see the shift of the strategy here. And you say, what shift of the strategy, man? He just took away the C file from black with this move, which is a very good move. He can't, he, if black takes and then white takes, white ends up with the file, or else they exchange all four rooks. Having the stronger center, having the king in the center in the end game is not good for Welly, so he would not benefit from exchanging all of the rooks by simply exchanging. That's why it was better in this instance to give up the file. And I know I screamed my fool head off, always take control of the file! Again, context. I'm giving you the beginner idea of the open file, but in the context of this particular setup, Welly is better off keeping the rooks. Because that's how he's going to be able to maintain long distance pressure in this game, which is absolutely what he has to do. But, and here comes, here comes Kramnik. Now the question, is that isolated pawn which is a passed pawn, is it weak or is it strong? Kramnik says it's strong. Well, he says, no, it's a target. Watch what Kramnik does in the next few moves. This is really instructive. It's really quite interesting. Bishop c8. Well, he is using every piece that he can in order to fight for the file. Correct? And keep an eye indirectly as well as directly, indirectly as well as directly on the... I know that's the dark squared bishop. It's still coming into here, just like the light squared bishop is. So there's an indirect, direct looking at the pun, and there is an indirect challenge for the file. So while he bombs his bishop back here, Kramnik takes his bishop. And what the reason he takes the bishop for is the light squared black bishop is more of an obstacle to this past pawn than the dark squared bishop. So Kramnik says removing obstacles is going to give him less chance to attack my past pawn, so I will exchange the bishops. Yeah, that's what he's doing. And he gets his last piece developed in the game. He takes the bishop. He takes the rook. And he takes the rook. And now you might think that Kramnik has made an error because he has given up the C file. What he has done is shifted the strategy. It was useful for him to maintain the tension in the C file, but he doesn't need it. The past pawn is more important. So he gives black the file in exchange for the passed pawn, and black is down a bishop and a rook, which could have attacked the pawn. So there's less power on the board, which means the passed pawn is now dangerous. That is fun to see how Kramnik did that, isn't it? That is really cool. He did that on purpose. He did not lose the C file. He gave Welly the C file in order to promote his pawn. Very interesting how he did this. And total central dominance. Fantastic. The hat's winning. 
That is winning. Now, the knight to b5, in order to help promote that pawn with the rook backing up, is really powerful. Let's see if he can get that done. But that's what makes this move so fantastic. And Welly knows this. So he's going to come into this, but, yeah, Kramnik goes knight b5, absolutely. Now he's going to help protect that pawn all the way in. Fabulous. Now the pawn is the threat to black, not the center. And, I mean, it is a central pawn. And he still has the center, and he still is going to the center. But to maintain his presence in the center is not as important now as it is to push that pawn. And he can push the pawn because he gave up a strategic position of a, an open file. But his other strategic point of having the passed pawn is better. That's what I wanted. That's what makes this game so fantastic. That is really awesome. Knight b5, and now a6. Okay, well, yeah, challenge the, challenge the knight, and but... Okay, now we see the power. Are you kidding me? He's willing to give up the knight for the passed pawn? Now we're seeing the power of the passed pawn. You think I'm kidding, right? It's even worth letting a power go, a piece go. Instead, push that pawn. Yeah, very interesting. It's such a great move at this point that Willie comes all the way up here to go check. And watch Kramnik's response to this. Kramnik's response here is really interesting. King to d3. Don't move the king back out of check. The king is a fighting piece. Move him up and fight, because remember, his knight is still threatened. So, moving toward the rook to threaten the... Now, well, he has to move the rook instead of take the knight. And notice, the king is more centralized. Great move! Great move. It got an exclamation point. Rook takes a2. Which in chess and nomenclature means a great move, yeah. Rook takes a2, and now can you feel the sweating of Welly? Do you see the power of the pass pawn? It is astonishing, isn't it? Just the lowly little pawn, and that pawn's dominating the game. Yeah, very interesting. Well, of course, Welly's going to come. Yeah. He has no choice. That's a forced move, right? Now watch. Now watch. And you're going, what the? You're supposed to be protecting the pawn. You're supposed to be punching the pawn in. He is. This is a beautiful demonstration of the ability of the white knight. He's attacking the rook, so the rook has to move out of safety. And now, knight d5, and that knight is the king of the universe. That knight owns the game, man. Fabulous. Fabulous how Kramnik did this. This is swing. I mean, it's fabulous. Fabulous, I tell you. Fabulous. Rook b5. Well, he is in trouble here. King c2. Get out of the way on the open file of all places. I wonder if that's almost meant to be a little tickle and a teasing slap against Well, Now, yeah, look, I'm going to put my king on your open file. But he is... <laughs> that's funny. He's keeping the rook in contact with that pawn. Yeah. And now bishop to c5. So now well, he has to bring everything out that he can. Right? Now watch this. Watch this. This, this is in preparation for stopping this guy from going in. Watch. This is fabulous. What Kramnik does. And you go, oh, for Pete's sake. How does that help him? It helps prevent the king from coming through the G and F8, doesn't it? Isn't that interesting? One last piece to be able to attack his pawn. 
that's pretty important. So that's why he pushed the pawn so that the king can come at it from here, right? And now, knight to c7, hitting the rook. And it is here that Welly resigned, which is quite interesting. The power of the pass pawn. One possible ending that could have occurred, which will show us the power of the pass pawn. I'm going to play this through for you. Is the rook. The rook, of course, is being hit, so he has to move out of the way. And now you get your queen. And here's what the pass pawn does for you. It eliminates another black piece. Right? Because now the knight has to take it. And in exchange for a pawn, now white is a piece up. And he's got the king in check. So the king can come to f7. And the rook can come to d7. The king can go back to g8. Then the knight to e8. And you can see the mating net. The idea here now is... There's nothing really to prevent the knight from taking f6. I mean, if he wants to move the pawn, he can, but that's going to still be the next move. Check. Because then that means the king has to go to h, and rook takes h7 mate. The power of a passed pawn, man. So that is a wonderful, wonderful lesson of Kramnik, which allows us to see the value of not just holding on to one strategy only, but of letting one advantage go in order to bring another advantage up. And then when that advantage uses its usefulness, let it go and bring something else up. That, that, that is a fantastic lesson, ultimately with one of the most powerful imbalances in all of chess, the past pawn. This is a great, great lesson from Vladimir Kramnik. So, there is your Backyard Professor Chess video. Thank you for watching my video. If you like my channel, feel free to subscribe, drop me a comment. And I hope you enjoyed seeing Vladimir Kramnik in action. He was one of the greatest players in the 1990s, without question. So, in the meantime, remember, be good, do well, have fun, sleep lots, but don't oversleep, because we've got a lot to do during the day. Be accomplished, be nice, make friends, make the world a better place than you found it in the morning that you woke up, and... I will see you guys in the next Backyard Professor Chess video.